In the introduction to his excellent yet deeply disturbing uh, book, From Darwin to Hitler, historian Richard Weikart begins with a quote from Adam Sedgwick, who was Charles Darwin's uh, mentor of natural science at the University of Cambridge. And Sedgwick uh, warned Darwin that there is a moral or metaphysical part of nature were it possible to break it, humanity in my mind would suffer a damage that might brutalise it and sink the human race into a lower grade of degradation than any into which it has fallen since the written records tell us of its history. So in other words, young Charles, if you reduce humanity to just material beings, then it will actually lead to the destruction of humanity. These chilling words now appear to be prophetic in my mind, since the emergence of and popularising of Charles Darwin's theory of evolution, many have used the theory to not just degrade humanity to the level of animals, but to butcher and kill millions. So in this week six lecture, we're looking at <clears throat> Darwinism and the eugenics movement. So what we'll be doing is we're looking at the historical context that it uh, appears in, the rise of the movement, how the, uh, the new eugenics movement uh, sets new ethical foundations, um, how the movement that expands, particularly in the US, um, the sterilization and birth control laws, how the church interacted with this new eugenics movement. And then we're going to touch on a very sensitive topic in eugenics and Nazi Germany, and then how eugenics is uh, still, still around today. So firstly, the, the historical context, I won't be looking at uh, Darwinism from a scientific point of view because it's outside my um, expertise. I failed science at school, so um, so I'm not looking at the theory scientifically, but its historical impact. And the most obvious and immediate impact of Darwin's theory is that Darwin made humans a part of nature, and because they're now humans are now a part of nature, they they are subject to natural laws. So if the law of survival of the fittest is applied to the animal world, then it must obviously be applied to humans as well, because humans are also animals. We're just more evolved. So in his 1871 book, The Descent of Man, Darwin argues that most human traits are innate and due to man's struggle for existence. So man, like every other animal, so that is his belief, has no doubt advanced to his pr uh, present highest condition through struggle for existence. If he is to advance still higher, he must remain subject to a severe struggle. So you, mankind must continue, like animals, to struggle against those those forces that try to uh, reduce it. And so that means, like animals, fight against other animals. And so humans must also, um, yeah, are in competition with each other. So um, Darwin definitely believed that um, humans are animals and that humans are uh, need to be continually, um, in order to survive, need to continually uh, fight against each other. Now, it's at this stage, and, and a lecture like this, a lot of Darwinists will um, repudiate this and kind of uh, defend Darwin against accusations of that Darwin didn't really be believe in eugenics, Darwin didn't really uh, believe in all the terrible things that were done in eugenics names, um, all of that shouldn't be laid at his feet because Darwin is just a scientist. He's just looking at the science and what pe how people apply that science. Well, that's that's up to them, but we shouldn't really, you know, Darwin shouldn't cop the flack for that. I don't agree <clears throat> with that, uh, mainly because Darwin himself uh, didn't agree with that. So in the introduction to The Descent of Man, his, his book, um, and The Descent of Man is, um, there's The Origin of Species, that, that book that was released in the 1850s. The Descent of Man is um, how the implication of evolution to mankind. That's kind of what uh, essentially it's about. And in the introduction, he states that the goal of the book, well, one of the goals of the book was to um, consider the value of the differences between the so-called races of man. So in, very, from the very beginning, the whole point of one of the points of the book is to actually show that there are differences between the races in mankind. Darwin rejected the influence of education, training and environment in shaping human nature. So in other words, non-Europeans, they couldn't be improved 
through education, through the right systems. And so this states things like, hardly anyone is so ignorant as to allow his worst animals to breed. So he's hinting at here, we shouldn't allow the worst humans to breed. Now he never goes deep into those thoughts, but it's it's not something, it's not a ridiculous and out of this world um, uh, conclusion or consequence to then go, well, what he's getting at here is that humans, you know, the worst humans shouldn't breed. Again, he writes, with savages, the weak in body or mind are soon eliminated, and those that survive commonly exhibit a vigorous state of health. We civilised men, on the hand, other hand, do our utmost to check the process of eliminated. So, you know, we actually stop people from, um, you know, the worst from being eliminated or dying off because we set up asylums for the imbecile and for the people who are sick. So he goes on to state that caring for the sick and inferior was a necessary evil. It's, it's not a good thing, it's actually an evil thing, but it's a necessary thing that we do. He, but he gives no scientific reason for this. And many of his followers don't support him in this idea that oh, it's a necessary evil. Why is it necessary? If there's no scientific reason for it, then we don't need to actually look after these imbeciles. The, the sick people. And so, like I said, he doesn't look in depth about the consequence for these ideas on society, but someone in his family does do that. Now, before we get to that, let's look at the historical context of what's going on. And there's two concurrent real uh, historical developments uh, happening during the uh, mid 19th century. One is the Industrial Revolution, is and the Industrial Revolution is driving urbanisation. And so um, <clears throat> why, why that's important is uh, generally a lot of, uh, before urbanisation, a lot of city people uh, were generally more of the upper class. And then all of a sudden urbanisation, industrialization leads to urbanisation. Urbanisation drives people from the country areas into the cities and the cities become overrun and really overcrowded like in that image there. And um, <clears throat> a lot of the upper class people were thinking that this was not just leading to a degradation of the actual look of the city, but also to the morals of society. Um, people were living in filth, um, gambling, drinking, all those sorts of um, social vices were on the increase due to urbanization. And so they wanted to improve society and lo and behold, during this time of how do we improve society, one way to improve it is through the Victorian era um, of philanthropy and caring for the poor, um, which we saw when we looked at uh, William Wilforce. He kind of starts that era up. That's one way to do it. But here with uh, Darwin's theory, you've got a more scientific way of actually dealing with it. And one way to deal with it is eugenics. The other, uh, historical context is European imperial expansion is exposing Europe to new cultures and and the native, uh, no matter what the, the continent is, uh, Europeans have now been exposed to these new cultures and European uh, anthropologists are studying these cultures um, and they're, you know, they're concluding these guys are really primitive and they, we can't change them. We're trying to change them, but we can't. Um, and so there's this idea that we can't, um, the native couldn't really progress anymore. They had reached their limit with evolutionary um, advance. And so the, the wasn't re they weren't really helping society in any way. They weren't really helping the, the flow of evolution. A.O. Neville, <clears throat> he's the chief uh, protector of Aborigines in, the, in Western Australia in 19, from 1915. Uh, Neville, if you've seen the movie, um, Rapid Proof Fence, he's the politician guy who's trying to capture those kids, um, played by, I think it's Kenneth Branagh or whatever his name is. Um, but he, he's the character in the film. He's, a, he's actual, the real guy. He said this about the Aboriginal Australians, that the, the native is a static uh, being incapable of advance. And so, <clears throat> although um, in, in the Australian context, the, you know, some church missions are involved in the stolen generation. A lot of the driving force behind that is this idea that the 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 Aboriginals cannot advance. They've 
and therefore they need to be controlled. Okay, and we need to try to get these um, these kids who you know, are you know, half caste kids. They have a hope of being advanced, so let's get them. Um, that's a social Darwinist idea. It's, it's not driven by the church. Um, <clears throat> the implication for these was that um, the the native didn't really have a place in the modern world, um, and so their dem demise was inevitable. And so a lot of uh, Australians point this out. So that's the kind of context you've, you've got um, in the in European countries. A lot of people getting together, and society seems to just be uh, a cesspool. And at the same time, these European societies are being exposed to more native cultures, and they're saying that hey, these guys aren't advanced as what we what we are, or what we think we are. And so <clears throat> they grow together now. Like I said, Darwin didn't explore uh, the consequences of his beliefs, but his cousin does. His cousin is Francis Galton, and he's considered the father of eugenics. Now, what eugenics is, um, it's a theory using uh, hereditary or the theories of hereditary to create a better race. So in other words, instead of waiting for uh, nature and survival of the fittest to kind of naturally remove the inferior biological traits in people eugenics is the human intervention in that process so <clears throat> if we don't want people with uh, diseases to pass on their disease to their children then we could wait for nature to eventually kill off those people with those genes through survival of the fittest that eugenics says well why wait for that why can't we get involved in that process and so the way you get involved in that process is, uh, you know, there's various ways from sterilization through segregation through eventually you'll hit, I believe, the Holocaust is a, um, <clears throat> is a form of uh, eugenics. Galton said, the first object of eugenics is to check the birth rate of the unfit instead of allowing them to come into being. Uh, though doomed in large numbers to perish prematurely, the second object is to improve the race by furthering the productivity of the fit by early marriages and healthy, healthful, healthful rearing of their children. Natural select selection rests upon excessive production and wholesale destruction. Eugenics on being more, no more individuals into the world that can be properly cared for. So in other words, there's two parts of eugenics. One is we're going to check or you know, we can prevent those who have inferior genes. Uh, or inferior hereditary genes to to reproduce, and at the same time, those who are we consider to be advanced or superior, uh, we all allow them to marry and have a lot of children. All right, natural selection does this, but it, you need a mass amount of death. Eugenics, um, you just essentially um, you're picking who can live, essentially who can live and who can reproduce. Um, and so he's trying to make out as if eugenics is more caring. Um, <clears throat> never has a theory been least caring. He be uh, Galton believed that all human qualities and faculties, moral, uh, physical, moral, mental, and religious, were essentially fixed at birth. So this is a key part of um, uh, social Darwinist and eugenics belief at the time that um, it wasn't just your your physical traits that got passed on to you. So um, some people say I look like my, my father. Um, it's not just that, but also if you were an out, if your parents were or one of your parents or grandparents were an alcoholic, that gene got passed on to you. If your mum had a had depression at some stage in her life, that gene got passed on to you. You had that. Your religious beliefs were passed on to you, not through any choices you made, but through your genes. And so you couldn't get around it. And so to improve the race, Galton believed um, the Anglo-Saxons needed to positive eugenics, so you know, essentially breed more people. That's what positive eugenics is all about. Um, and Darwin agreed with Galton. So those who try to defend Darwin, um, it's, it's awkward for them because Darwin actually agreed with what his cousin is writing about here. Uh, so Darwin agreed with this, this idea of eugenics. Uh, Ruth Cowan, who's a modern historian, says... Rarely in history of in the history of science has such an important generalization been made on the basis of so little concrete evidence, so badly put, and so naively conceived. There is 
no actual real science. I'll probably say this at the end, um, but I'll say it now. Um, in the 1950s, they discovered DNA, and they discovered that pretty much all of this uh, science is just completely um, not founded on anything that's uh, remotely scientific. As you may have guessed, these kind of these new ideas lead to new ethical foundations. They they really change the way ethics uh, is is conceived, um, and this is not a unthought of consequence. It's something that is vital and something that is deliberate. So Philippa Levine, Alison Bashford, they write in um, this is from their Oxford History of Eugenics. Uh, big textbook. So eugenics always had an evaluative logic at its core. Some human life was of more value to the state, to the nation, to the race, future generations, than other human life. And because you had to make a judgment between superior, inferior beings, you had to make a judgment to of, are these people good for the state? Are these people good for what's coming after us? Then you have to have an ethical basis for that. And so... Um, and the reason for uh, this morality um, is that morals themselves come from uh, evolution. You hear this still with uh, atheists today, evolutionary atheists, that morals actually are part of the evolutionary pro uh, process. And so Friedrich Joel, who's a professor at the University of Vienna, is an ethical philosophist, um, he writes, morality too is a product of evolution and is in a state of continual transformation. Um, another guy, Von Canary, agrees. He says, uh, uh, ethic base, uh, an, eth an ethic consistent with Darwin's theory knows no natural or innate rights and can therefore only speak of acquired rights, even in relation to tribes of people. So although there's a lot of... Uh, ways you could deal, a lot of issues with this. I want to focus on three main ones. So how did you know, the emergence of Darwinism and eugenics, how did it change the way people thought about what is a human, change the way people thought about Christian charity, and change the way people thought about life and death. Now, what is a human? And so how does Darwinism and eugenics change the way we viewed humanity? So what, what is a human being? The primary change was the, the rejection of of this idea of equality of all humans and a promotion of uh, evolutionary hierarchy of humanity. In other words, there are inferior, superior beings. Not everyone is equal. This idea that people are created in the image of God, therefore all people are equal, core Christian belief, that is completely rejected in this new worldview. Um, evolution could not occur without significant variations within each um, species and as I said at the start Darwin made human beings part of the animal world and so we are part of that process as well some individuals were more fit than others and thus survived and reproduced others were less fit and um, perished and needed to perish without reproducing um, and so you get these terms of like I said inferior superior less valuable more valuable um, things like that. Um, <clears throat> Ernst Haeckel, um, he's a German zoologist. He, uh, he writes a lot about this. So he says that the, uh, between the most highly developed animal soul and the least developed human soul, there exists only a small quantitative but not qualitative difference. You know, he gives a convenient picture for this. In other words, the difference between the lowest human being and the highest animal, ape, that's a smaller step between the lowest human being and the highest human being. So in other words, the lowest human being, which he think, which most at the time thought were the Aboriginal Australians, they were the lowest of low, they are biologically closer to animals than they are to the European race, particularly the Aryan or the, um, the, the most advanced European race. And so he's essentially saying, that there's these people, you know, the lowest of the human uh, evolution, they have more in common with animals. Um, so this division could be along race lines, it could be along hereditary, different scientists have different theories, 
Um, but the core value or the core belief that drove the whole thing was this idea of some people are more valuable to society than others. And so we need to make that judgment. Now, that still drives the current sterilization, abortion, euthanasia debates from then till now. Another thing that they completely disagreed with is uh, Christian charity. If the world is filled with these uh, inferior people, why on earth are we economically um, and practically looking after them? That doesn't make sense. If they are a burden to society economically, they're a burden to society uh, in the evolutionary process, what's the point of looking after them? And so they have a real issue with Christian charity, with Christians looking after the sick and the poor. So <clears throat> Robert Kosman, who's a German zoologist in 1880, wrote this essay that the Darwin and world, Darwinian worldview must look upon the present sentimental concept of the value of the life of a human individual as an overestimate completely hindering the progress of humanity. The human state also, like every other animal community of individuals, must reach an even higher level of perfection if the possibility exists in it through the destruction of the less endowed individuals. Notice how this idea that all people are, you know, have value or equal, it's a sentimental concept. Madison Grant, who's this guy uh, on screen, wrote uh, The Passing of the Great Race. He's American. He says, Mistaken regard for what are believed to be divine laws and a sentimental belief in the sanctity of human life tend to prevent both the elimination of defective infants and the sterilization of such adults as are themselves of no value to the community. Mistaken regard for divine laws, and in other words, what comes from the Bible and a sentimental belief in the sanctity of human life. What do they do? They prevent us from killing babies who are defective and sterilizing those, their, their parents so that they don't produce anymore. Uh, Wilhelm Schollmeyer, probably to the, as clearly as anyone. Um, the views of Christianity insofar as they are all influential, do not have the tendency to improve selection, either consciously or subconsciously, but rather naturally, unconsciously, has the opposite tendency. In other words, Christianity and Christian beliefs are as opposite to uh, these ideas, these scientific ideas, as they could, as you could get. And so, eugenicists during this period, late nineteenth, early twentieth century, they reject the Victorian era's concern for the poor, for the oppressed. So we, like I said, we saw with William Wilberforce and his Clapham gang that, you know, they make being good fashionable. And all these uh, great organisations start up that care for the poor, that get kids into school, that improve life. And now you've got this new science that's showing that that's actually harming society. And so you, We'll look at this later, but you can't imagine the church ever getting involved in this. Lastly, they changed the view of life and death. As as you all know, in Christianity, life is uh, sorry, death is the enemy. So death isn't a natural or good. Uh, it's not a natural part of life. Um, it's a result of mankind's sin against God. Um, in Darwinism, though, death is necessary and death for the right people was actually a good thing. Um, and so it comes as no surprise that Darwin recognised this. So he says that it may be difficult, but we ought to admire the savage instinctive hatred of the queen bee, which urges her, instant, which urges her instantly to destroy the young queens, her daughters, as soon as born, or to perish herself in the combat. For undoubtedly this is for the good of the community and maternal love and maternal hatred, though the latter fortunately is more most rare, is all the same in the inextricable, extraordinary principle of natural selection. So Darwin admired the queen bee, her uh, 
instinctive hatred for any rival and the fact that she'd commit infanticide. Um, but he doesn't see it as a model for human conduct, since humans have a tendency for care and love. But once again, he doesn't give a scientific reason for this. And so all you need is someone to come along and go, well, if humans are animals as well, and the queen bee destroys those who are her rivals and commits infanticide, and yeah, why can't we do it if we're you know we're just more advanced than them? Um, and particularly if if ethics are a constant evolution and constantly changing, who's to say that if, you know the the morals of society have moved on after Darwin's death? Um, so Darwin hesitated at this because he knew the implications, but others didn't hesitate as Frederick Nietzsche. Um, so <clears throat> there are cases in which a child, uh, having a child, would be a crime. In the case of chronic invalids, um, and so he, he goes on to say that the, the sympathy for this is kind of ill-constituted. So we, sh we shouldn't really have any kind of um, sympathy for or you know problems with killing. Uh, particularly a child who is an who has a uh, is an invalid. Uh, one terrible story uh, I read about was from Alfred Alfred Hoshk. Uh, he's a professor of psychiatry at the University of Freiburg, in the late uh, 19th century. He has a nine-year-old patient who's dying from some an unknown disease. Now her father wanted to take her home so she could die at home, but Hoshk wanted her to stay to stay in hospital so he could study her. So he fills a syringe with morphine and he's going to go kill her, but he decides not to. But later he actually writes that there are circumstances in which killing by a physician is no crime. So Darwinian in egalitarianism so, um, was not only a factor in contributing to the devaluing of the disabled, but also um, they had these issues with... Um, with money, so I don't know if I've got a slide on this. I do not. So they they saw because science is, is good, you know, good and proper, or whatever. But uh, if you're trying to sell this, particularly to to the government, you want to say you know you're wasting all this money, sending all this money to help set up these asylums and all that sort of stuff, and caring for the poor. Well, why don't we actually just get rid of these mentally and physically handicapped people? That way you actually save a lot of money. So in 1911, um, that there was a science journal that had Umushk, I think that's how you say it, uh, had a, uh, an essay competition. And the essay question was uh, what to do, what, oh, sorry, what do the bad racial elements cost the state society? And so the winner was a guy called Ludwig Jans, and he calculated that the cost of inch institutionalizing inferior people in the city of Hamburg alone was over 31 million uh, Reichsmarks. And so, and that's annually. And so this idea, which is still prevalent today, still, you know, in New South Wales, we've had the euthanasia debate. It's still prevalent about how much are these people costing our society? How much is it costing the health system to look after these inferior sick people? Um, <clears throat> by 1900 though, the eugenics movement's not actually that popular. Um, a lot of people, uh, you know, it's kind of on the fringe of society. Galton and Darwin's theory is popular, but eugenics isn't. Um, and eugenics eventually will get picked up in Germany, but one place it becomes really popular is in the US uh, at the start of the 20th century. And two guys that drive it are uh, Charles Davenport and Henry Goddard. Uh, Henry Goddard, for example, in 1906, he creates an intelligence test for students at Vineland, um, which measures, measures their uh, mental abilities compared to normal people. And he sorted them up into all these categories. And you can see the picture there is all the categories that he's got. Um, and so he thought the moron, so this person up here, they were stuck in their evolutionary process and they couldn't actually make moral decisions. And they can't really get any better. Uh, he researches uh, the background of 35 of his students and found that the moron trait was passed on um, through feeble-mindedness. That's a really common term in um, eugenics groups at this time. 
um, and that these people that he's studying, but the ones that have these kind of moron traits, uh, their families also pass on things like alcoholism, uh, they're, they're prostitutes, they're criminals, and so he thinks that that's getting passed on as well. Uh, he said to the New Jersey State Conference of Charities and Corrections in 1910 that feeble-mindedness are at the root of probably two-thirds of the problems you have before you. The cause was defective ancestry. So here he is at a conference for <clears throat> charities. So who are we going to give money to? And corrections, who are we going to, you know, target and he's saying two-thirds of your problems are coming from this issue of feeble-mindedness which is being passed on by hereditary and so he's implying here you need to do something about this or we need to do something about this and i've already got some ideas charles davenport wrote to the new york times at the time uh, in 1910 said just as we have strains of scholars of military men we have strains of paupers of sex offenders strains the strong tendency towards larceny, assault, lying, running away. The cost for society is enormous. Now, this is not some strange guy. It's kind of this weird theory that no one really believed. Um, President Theodore Roosevelt said, I agree with you that society has no business to permit degenerates to reproduce their kind. And so the upper echelons of US government starting to really get on the social Darwinists or the eugenics movement. They also had uh, exhibits in America. And so you've got this exhibit, it's called the uh, Pan Pan Am Panama, I mean, <coughs> Pacific International uh, Exhibition. It's in San Francisco in 1915. At this exhibition, they've got a race betterment uh, exhibit. You can see it in the photo there. Um, which outlines how eugenics could better the human race. And so instead of going to the Easter show and wasting all your money, you go to this uh, international um, uh, festival, uh, yeah, fair, I suppose, um, and you can learn about how eugenics is making the world better. How is it doing it? Uh, one of the leading guys uh, driving it was John Harvey Kellogg. Now, John Harvey Kellogg is, as you can see, he is the, uh, the Kellogg's guy. Um, and he creates uh, cornflakes for those of you who like cornflakes. Cornflakes was created uh, in order to better the human race. And so Kellogg thought that the environment could help genes actually change and could better them to a certain extent. And so people needed to be healthier. That's why he actually creates cornflakes. The cornflakes was made in order to get people to have a healthier breakfast and be healthier themselves. So those of you that enjoy cornflakes, that's uh, the reason behind it. Um, <clears throat> and so what he's trying to create in America is a white Protestant uh, value system society. That is the goal. All right. Now, <clears throat> Madison Grant was probably, uh, we saw a picture of him before. He's probably uh, one of the leading uh, drivers in the eugenic movement in the U.S., he is as American as you can get. He has an ancestor who signed the uh, Declaration of Independence. Um, and he thought that his own race was dying out in New York because New York was filling up with foreigners. Um, and so he writes, um, you know, the passing of the great race. He invents the Nordic race as the you know, most evolved race. Um, this um, becomes really uh, popular, particularly uh, Europe because, you know, Nazi Germany will consider themselves as uh, related to the Nordic race. Um, he said that if blonde hair, blue eyed Nordic mate people um, mate with, uh, they often use the term mate with rather than have sex with, um, with Jews or Negroes, an inferior race of genes uh, will just ultimately destroy the Nordic race. So in other words, this idea that if a superior race and an inferior race uh, mate, then you've got a middle race that is produced um, and because you got that, um, ultimately the higher race will die out. Now I want you to think of, remember that for later on, because there's going to be a guy who agrees with him, um, with that a rather famous guy in history. Um, he believed obviously Jim Crow laws are going to be great uh, in the South, so he has no problem with Jim Crow laws. Um, 
But the main issue he wants to deal with is immigration. So he wants to make sure that the US drop their uh, immigration ratio because that way um, they can actually control uh, who is mating with who, who is reproducing with who. Um, and so the eugenicists get a lot of uh, senators on their side. And so Congress in 1924 passed that immigration restriction legislation. Um, and yeah, Grant is absolutely yeah, ecstatic with this. And so they, they decrease over the next 40 years by 97% than the people that they allow in into the US. Um, and so they wouldn't allow, because they wanted to make America into the great white Christian nation. They particularly reject Jews from Eastern Europe and Germany. Yeah, think about what's going to come. Um, one of the people they reject is Anne Frank's dad because he's Jewish. And so Anne Frank dies in a Nazi concentration camp or death camp, not just because the German government thought she was an inferior race, but also, but also because the US government thought she was in, from an inferior race. Um, the US, uh, particularly US scientists, that they don't like really uh, looking at eugenics. It's kind of an embarrassing plight on them. Um, <clears throat> together with this tightening of immigration laws, you've got um, new sterilization and birth control uh, coming in during this time period. Um, and we saw this before that controlling who mated with who, you know, who's uh, producing kids, is really important uh, part of this process. Uh, Ernst Heichel again, he says that likewise, we have the right, if one prefers, the duty to end the deep suffering of our fellow humans. If strong illness without hope of recovery makes their existence unbearable, and if we, and if they themselves ask us for the redemption from evil, this argument that we have uh, almost the duty to help our uh, fellow humans uh, who are suffering um, sounds very Christian, but he, what he's talking about is we should help them by killing them. And once again, we've just had that argument used for the euthanasia laws uh, in New South Wales. Colonial countries around the world um, started to ramp up controlling feeble-mindedness. Um, so you've got segregation for the mentally defective um, being brought in, put all the Australian dates in there, so Tasmania 1920, Victoria 1922, Queensland 1938. And New South Wales 939 is bringing in um, segregation of those who are mentally disabled. Um, it's just crazy. Uh, they bring in... Um, sterilization laws so uh, laws to prevent those from um, reproducing so switzerland in 929 uh, 28 sorry um, and then you got other countries germany 933 germany will eventually sterilize 400,000 roughly uh, between 39 uh, 33 and 39 together with this you got the uh, beginning of a popular popularization of uh, Planned Parenthood with Margaret Sanger. So in 1919, she states that more children from fit, less from the unfit. That is the chief issue of birth control. So from its very beginning, Planned Parenthood was a eugenics um, organization. She, um, Margaret Sanger was uh, all in favor of eugenics. Uh, ironically, uh, for uh, people like Hillary Clinton and uh, Barack Obama, who fund it and constantly tweet about how good Planned Parenthood are, uh, Margaret Sanger did originally um, want to completely get rid of the Af African American race. <clears throat> but obviously, Barack Obama does want those historical facts um, interfering with his uh, trying to become popular on Twitter. So, Margaret. So Planned Parenthood is still today is a eugenics movement. Don't let anyone tell you differently. They focus on birth control because that's how they get popular. Um, so how does, the, how does the church come into this? So one of the most disturbing things in researching this is um, the church embraces this, on the whole, the church embraces these new ideas. Um, <clears throat> there's several reasons for this, but one of the main ones is <clears throat> from Darwin... Charles Darwin's theory onwards, there was this pressure in society that the old way 
of viewing the world that was wrong and now we've got this new scientific way of dealing with the world and understanding the world and because we've got this new way of you know scientific way of looking at the world the clergy you know the church they needed to keep up with this and so in order to do that they they embraced it and so at the same time that science is increasing the uh, the social role and importance of the church is decreasing. So how does the church face that issue? Well, a lot in the church thought, well, why don't we just adopt these modern beliefs and we kind of Christianize this um, eugenics um, scientific beliefs that are coming out. And so it was this idea that um, they needed to keep up to date. They needed to keep uh, current. And so the church really uh, faltered with this because you needed to uh, keep up to date and i'll say this here i'll say this in future lectures um <clears throat> and particularly when we look at uh the right the nazis uh in a future lecture i'll talk more about this but you do have this in the 19th century particularly um and into the 20th century the the idea of the, the bible as the inerrant word of god that has been completely eroded within the church and I will argue, and and people like Philip Jenkins and, and that in our next in our tutorial on World War One, um, will meet him. But I argue, and he agrees that, um, or I agree with him that when the church loses its foundation, biblical foundation, if you don't believe the Bible is the word of God, you are susceptible to whatever current uh, movement is happening in society. So whatever is current and vogue in society, you will follow that. And so in the late 19th century, early 20th century, eugenics is the popular thing. And so the church hops on board the eugenics train because it's lost this idea that the Bible is the word of God. You cannot be a Christian and follow eugenics. Yeah, this idea, as we saw, they reject this idea that all humans are created equal. They, they deliberately came out and rejected that, that, you know, this Christian belief, we don't believe this anymore. And so you, you cannot marry those two things together. Uh, Christine Rosen, who wrote this book, Preaching Eugenics, which if you're interested, great book on this. She said that Pro Pro Protestants proved the more most enthusiastic and numerically powerful group of religious participants in eugenics movements. And so, <clears throat> and, and this is not, it's not a small group within the church. It's actually, um, like Rosen talks about how it's, it's pretty much the majority of the church in some way shape or form embrace this movement there's a def definite lack of um, opposition from this now we reach uh these this issue of darwinism eugenics and nazi germany in um in the i suppose you call it a documentary um what's it called the david it's called the no, no intelligence allowed whatever that one's called um and they interviewed weikart and people had an issue with um the, the fact that um no intelligence allowed is that it i forget shouldn't do this off the top of my head but um this idea that um you shouldn't link eugenics with with nazi germany like that's an that's not a correct link and so this is an issue um that a lot of people have with the eugenics movement you shouldn't talk about what nazi germany do because that's not eugenics that's just anti-semitism um and so eugenics has a bad name because of nazi Ger germany i'll give you two examples so this is the oxford handbook of history of eugenics i've quoted from earlier um and so these guys dirk moses and dan stone there's a chapter that they've got on um uh, eugenics and um, genocide and so they say eugenics and anti-semitism were not necessarily related and the holocaust was motivated more by the latter than the former in other words the holocaust was motivated by anti-semitism not by eugenics now i've taught the holocaust for over a decade now and i've studied it for 15 years or more and i would 100 percent disagree with that statement the holocaust was not primarily primarily motivated by anti-semitism and one key reason for that if you want a key reason is that anti-semitism had existed for thousands of years 
you could or you could argue anti-Semitism's back in the Book of Esther with Haman, um, but none of those anti-Semitic move, movements had any, produced anything like the Holocaust. And modern anti-Semitism, which emerged in the 19th century, was driven by science and this idea that the Jews were an inferior race. And so you look at key historians like uh, uh, Ian Kershaw, who's probably the you know best historian on Darwin. Oh, I'm sorry, on Hitler, and even he says that social Darwinist ideas were motivated through the Holocaust. Um, they go on to say eugenics does not necessarily entail genocide because eugenics was typically conceptualized and practiced with respect to the same group. In other words, you know, you can't, you can't, eugenics doesn't motivate people to commit genocide. But what if you take over a nation and you've got the resources and the time to actually put those eugenic, eugenics ideas into practice? What would happen to that nation? And so, was Hitler a Darwinist? Let's prove this first. Um, you don't need even a brief read in the Mein Kampf, which is an extremely boring book, um, but even a brief reading of it, you can see the influence of Darwinism on Hitler. So I'll give you two quotes. If nature does not wish that weaker individuals should mate with the stronger, she wishes even less that a superior race should intermingle with an inferior one. Two things from that quote. One, where is he getting his worldview from? From nature. In other words, by nature, I think he just means the current scientific um movement so what science is saying right now which they're saying is natural because it's just come from nature not from god and this idea that there are weaker and stronger individuals but there's also superior and inferior races Hitler will believe that uh, he goes on to say any crossing of two beings that are not exactly the same produces a medium between the level of the two parents in other words You've got an offspring that will probably be higher than the racially lower parent, but not as high as the high one. So we saw with Madison Grant this idea that if we have a higher bean and a lower bean, they mate, then you're going to have this weird in-between bean, and ultimately that will destroy the, old, the higher one. That's exactly what Hitler is getting at here. Such mating is contrary to the will of nature. So now nature, or the natural laws, have a will. <clears throat> And the stronger must dominate and not blend with the weaker, thus sacrificing his own greatness. Only the born weakling can view this as cruel. But the stronger must dominate and not blend with the weaker. When he's writing this, this is not radical. There would be a lot of scientists who would agree with what he's getting at here. And it doesn't cause a stir, this book. It, it's not super popular up until he becomes uh, Chancellor and then uh, it kind of becomes compulsory reading or everyone gets a copy whether they read it is up to them but it doesn't cause a stir and so it, people who did read it this this idea of stronger in, individuals and all that sort of stuff that that doesn't cause us cause any kind of stir um 1927 until he's in uh, giving a speech politics is the striving and struggle of a people Volk uh, just a German word for people, for its daily bread and its existence in the world, just as the individual devotes its entire life to the struggle for the for existence, for its daily bread, and then comes a second matter, caring for future survival, caring for the children. It is the struggle for the uh, for the moment and the struggle for posterity, and all thinking and all planning serve, in the deepest sense, this struggle. For the preservation of life. Now, go back to what Dar started our lecture on Darwin. Darwin said that human beings have struggled to get to their present state and need to struggle into the future. And that's the way he'll abuse all of life. He's talking about politics. Mein Kampf is my struggle. It's German for my struggle. So he views life as a struggle, which is a Darwinistic way of viewing life. Uh, after coming to power, um, this is in 1933, he's at the Nuremberg Party Rally. So the gulf between the lowest creature, which can still be style, styled man, and our highest races is greater than that between the lowest type of man and the highest ape. He is agreeing with what Ernst Haeckel has already said, and we saw that earlier. So Ernst Haeckel is 
already he's a German zoologist, he's already given this idea out. Hitler's just repeating that. And he's he's repeating it at the the Nazi Party rally. That's that's the Nuremberg uh, rallies every year. He's repeating it and he's saying this is Nazi doctrine essentially. This is what we believe. Um, nineteen forty two, so into the war. Um, nineteen forty two is important because it's the, the pivot year in the war in World War Two. It's the pivot where um, people in Germany start to realise these things aren't going our way. And the smartest ones in Germany realise that we're actually going to lose this war. So in the middle of that, Hitler says, a deeply serious principle of a great military philosopher states that struggle and thus war is the father of all things. Whoever casts even a glance at nature as it is will find this principle confirmed as valid for all organisms and for all happenings, not only in this earth, but even far beyond it. So this principle of life is struggle, life is you know, war, that's, that's true for all organism. The entire universe appears to be ruled only by this one idea, that eternal selection takes place in which the stronger in the end preserves its life and the right to life and the weaker fails. Um... I think there is absolutely no doubt that Hitler is a uh, Darwinist. Some people, because Hitler went to a Catholic church as a kid, and Hitler will sometimes mention God in or you know the Almighty uh, in his speeches. That oh, he was Christian. There's he hated Christianity. We look at this when we look at Nazism, but he hated Christianity. He just uses that because he's a politician, and he knows most of his supporters at the time, or most of the country, are actually. Yeah, they go to church, they're Christians. So, as is hinted at here, um, the the survival of the German race, she called the Aryan race, this, their survival needed warfare and they needed this struggle. Hitler saw World War II as integral to the... Uh, evolutionary process and the advancement of the Aryan race. Okay, uh, Richard Weichart talks about this um, and he, he, he points out that the war is not just, uh, oh man, we didn't want this to happen. From the very time Hitler gets into power, in 1935 he sets up a four-year plan to start a war and the war starts in 1939. And so war is there and it's not just war for the sake of war or war for you know create the great german race a great german empire i mean it's we need a greater empire because we are the greatest race and we need to expand our race and we need to expand uh the, literally the number of people in the Aryan race and therefore we need more space for that we need lebensraum or living space and so the reason he expands into uh Austria, the, the reason he expands particularly into Czechoslovakia, into Poland, and then into Eastern Europe with uh, Operation Barbarossa. There are political ends. I like. I don't deny that there's you know, political and military ends, but there's also a key driving force that he will constantly state is this idea that we need more living space for our superior race. Now, another key indication that this was vital for uh, the German war effort. And the Holocaust was not a, uh, a side piece. Uh, it wasn't a, a, why are you guys doing that? Uh, the, I think the Holocaust was also vital um, for them winning the German, uh, for Germany winning the actual war. In 1942, the start of 1942, very few Jews had actually died in the Holocaust. By the end of 1943, 80% of those Jews who would die in the Holocaust are all dead. So in that, it's pretty much an 18-month period in from uh, 1942 into 1943, most of the Jews are dying. Now, to kill those Jews, uh, you've got to use a whole heap of resources, you've got to use a whole heap of manpower. And in 1942 and 43, as I said before, the war is going against Germany. He needs those people, those resources at the front, but he doesn't. He, th he keeps them to kill the Jews. Why? Because to kill the Jews is to kill off the vermin, to kill off the 
uh, parasites within our society. And yes, there's anti-Semitic beliefs in there. I don't deny that. But the way he sells it constantly isn't so much anti-Semitism, it's the scientific rationale for it. So eugenicists today need to deal with that. And they don't like dealing with it because I think as, as Christians, we can point out this is what happens. Now, eugenics is not something from the past that uh, some weirdos believed and we've moved on because we're more advanced and uh, life progresses. Um, still very much alive today. Peter Singer, Australian biologist, uh, bioethicist, I mean, he says, when the death of a disabled infant will lead to the birth of another infant with better prospects of a happier life, the amount, the total amount of happiness will be greater if the disabled infant is killed. So in other words, when a disabled infant is born, uh, that's going to produce sadness in the world, essentially. So it's actually happier for the world if we actually just kill it. He goes on uh, in other uh, places to talk about how uh, infants born with disabilities, you know, dead infants born with disabilities should just be used as horse feed. Uh, he, uh, Peter Singer, is, uh, influences or advises our government on bioethical issues, and this is his view of mankind. Um, the ironic thing is that uh, I saw a, two years ago, there was a survey that came out, people had done research into the lives of disabled um, children, uh, people, um, what the, I forget what they had, um, I think it was uh, cerebral palsy actually, and they looked into them and they were, they had a higher rate of happiness than um, normal people. So, so much for Peter Singer's idea that these people wouldn't be happy. Richard Dawkins, uh, he tweeted about this, this got him in a bit of trouble. It's one thing to deplore eugenics on ideological, political, moral grounds. It's quite another to conclude that it wouldn't work in practice. Of course it would. It works for cows, horses, pigs, dogs and roses. Why on earth wouldn't it work for humans? Facts ignore ideology. Richard Dawkins is, as you can see, essentially just saying eugenics actually would work. Essentially, the reason why it wouldn't work is people have problems with it. It's what's wrong with people. So the world's leading atheist is just essentially admitting that uh, eugenics is actually not that bad a thing and actually is scientific. So it's, it's not something that's dead and buried eugenics. It's just more hidden in society. Um, the whole point of um, the 12-week scan for pregnant ladies, it's got nothing to do with the mother seeing the child. It's got everything to do with if that child has, um, you know, as they measure the neck, if the child, if they think the child may have some sort of birth defect, the next question will be, do you want it terminated? Do you want to kill your baby? That's the whole point of it. World Health Organization, who's uh, obviously the last few years been in the news, um, they tweeted this. Uh, this is in, um, I think it was in March of 2022, so this year. Um, it's World's World Birth Defects Day, which I didn't realise was the day. The most common severe birth defects are congenital heart defects, Down syndrome. So, and this once again caused all this controversy about you know people with Down syndrome tweeting, yeah, I'm not a birth defect kind of thing. I have a congenital heart disease. I'll um, obviously born with it, it's pulmonary stenosis so according to this i am i should be celebrating this day you know i've i'm essentially a walking around birth defect and so it starts off with little tweets like this it starts off with little ideas and then it grows into what we've got in new south wales with the abortion laws being brought in and euthanasia being brought in and it always starts with a good reason for why should we should bring it in but you know one of the reasons you study history is to learn where things go um, some good resources on this. Um, Richard Weichart, anything by Richard Weichart, he's an expert on this, absolute expert. Uh, From Darwin to Hitler is a really good book, but it is pretty full on. Uh, the Death of Humanity and the Case of Life is, is quite good. Weichart is a Christian. Uh, Jerry Bergman is a Christian as well. The Hitler and the Nazi uh, Darwinian worldview, uh, if you want to deal with people who try to defend Darwinism. Uh, my email's there if you want to. Uh, ask a question.